All right, we'll hold on to your seats. We're going to take a voyage to the ocean and uh, follow, uh, trace the, 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 the uh, again, this voyage of Paul as he goes from Caesarea, uh, at least in this chapter, to the, the um, island of Malta. But before we uh, get to, to the map, I do want to spend just a few moments reviewing what we looked at last week. Now, remember last week we saw the second of the two encounters that Paul had before he boarded the ship for Rome. Now, this time before his most illustrious audience yet. Remember how Jesus said that his disciples would stand before kings and governors and they would testify of the gospel. That's what Paul was doing here. Uh, among this crowd was Herod Agrippa II, who was the son of the Herod who had James killed with a sword and the great-grandson of the Herod who tried to kill Jesus after he was born. There was Portius Festus, the new governor, uh, after Felix uh, of Judea. Uh, the tribunes, of which Joseph, or excuse me, Josephus tells us there were five at Caesarea, and the prominent or affluent men of the city. And even though it was before such an esteemed assembly, Paul did not hesitate to tell them the truth. Now remember, he started by giving his testimony. How as a Pharisee, he had hated and persecuted Christians, pursuing them as far as foreign cities. How while he was on his way to Damascus, Jesus appeared to him in his glory and called him to be his witness. And how instead of arresting and imprisoning believers in Damascus, he began to preach the truth he once tried to destroy. His life was transformed. Now, since many there uh, who were present would not have known Paul or known about him, he did call on the, the, the Jews to bear witness that the things he said were true. And when we share our testimony with people, not everybody we share with is necessarily going to know what we were like B.C., you know, before Christ. But, um, you know, sometimes we, we can point to witnesses. It's not just we who are saying it, but others also saw us. Now, this reminded us that though it is important that we be able to point to the objective evidence, that evidence that is outside of us, that God exists and that the Bible is His Word, that our subjective evidence is also important, what the Lord has done for us. We need to be ready to tell others. Because Paul's experience on the road to Damascus was not unique in every way. He tells us in Ephesians 2 that we also were dead in our sins, and we were the enemies of God. But while we were in that condition, He also made us alive purely out of His mercy and His grace. And now, like Paul, we also serve Him. I mean, what's the difference? Paul was dead. He made him alive. He began to serve Him. Same thing is true with us. So we can share that with others and show them the difference that Christ makes in our lives. Well, from there, he went on to share the gospel. Of course, we don't want to eliminate that. It's not just a change of life, but it is that Jesus suffered, that he died, and that he rose again, the firstborn from the dead, never to die again, and that it's through faith in him that we are saved from the wrath of God. Now, when Festus heard him, he thought that he was crazy. And sometimes people are going to think that we're crazy. When we share the gospel with them, especially in today's society, which is so steeped with secular science. But notice that Paul didn't, wasn't shaken by that. He continued to affirm with calm confidence that the things that he said were true because he had genuine faith. He was firmly convinced. There was no doubt in his mind. Paul invited King Agrippa to come to Christ. But again, Agrippa was unwilling. And then finally, after conferring with the council, Agrippa concluded that Paul might have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. But since his appeal had been registered, it had to be carried out. Paul had to be taken to Rome. But again, Paul didn't mind. That's what Paul wanted. He wanted to go to Rome because that is where Jesus said he would go to preach the gospel. And that's really all that Paul wanted to do. Now, this morning, Paul begins his voyage to Rome. Now, what we want to see basically are three things from our text. We want to see the storm. We want to see uh, the, the promise, the light of that promise and the darkness of that storm. And then we want to see, of course, that promise fulfilled. 
So um, <clears throat> I'm going to ask uh, BJ to go ahead and put the map up, and we'll, we'll get to it just, just briefly, a couple of comments. Um, but once it was determined that Paul should go to Rome, he was entrusted with some other prisoners to Julius. Julius, uh, we're told by Luke, was a centurion of the Augustan cohort, which is a division of the Roman army that consisted of somewhere between 400 and 600 men. Now, later, Luke is going to tell us how many people were on board the ship. So not all of these men were on the ship, but some of them were with him. But these men were under the governor's direct command. They were named in honor of the emperor Augustus, which means that they were, you know, uh, well, a very select group, uh, likely selected for their distinguished careers. Now, he loaded them onto an Adramidian ship, and Adramidium was a city on the west coast of Asia Minor between Pergamum and Troas. If you, if you look at Asia on the map, okay, uh, on the western coast of Asia Minor, you'll see Pergamum, but I don't think um, Troas is shown. Um, but the ship originated from Adramidium. I don't think that's on the map either. And from there, uh, was likely headed in that direction with its cargo. Now, Luke mentions that Paul was accompanied by Aristarchus of Macedonia. Perhaps you remember Aristarchus. He was one of those two um, souls that was dragged before the mob in Ephesus um, uh, when Demetrius and the silversmiths, remember, were complaining against Paul. Uh, uh, he had earlier accompanied Paul on one of his trips. Paul calls him his fellow worker. And interestingly, in Colossians 4.10, he calls Aristarchus his fellow prisoner or my fellow prisoner because on board the ship he goes with Paul to Rome he actually shares in Paul's imprisonment don't know if he's necessarily uh, a prisoner but he is there to minister to Paul now William Ramsey suggests that he accompanied Paul on this trip as a slave because Paul could not really have friends uh, along for this journey now again I also ask you to note the use of the pronoun we which indicates that Luke is again with him and Luke was likely allowed to accompany Paul as his personal physician. Now, what follows is a rather comprehensive account of their travels, again, showing Luke's attention to details. So see if you can follow along. I think there is a line that shows you where things begin and where they go. So leaving Caesarea, they landed at Sidon the next day, a port city, 67 miles north of Caesarea where they stop to load and unload cargo. I think you understand that the Adramidian ship and the Alexandrian ship that he's going to be on a bit later, these are cargo ships. And this is the way that the Roman soldiers were transporting their prisoners uh, in these days. So they stop there to load or unload cargo. And here Julius allowed Paul to visit his friends and to receive care. Uh, we read earlier in the book of Acts that Paul and Barnabas um, when they were on their way to the Jerusalem Council, that they had traveled through this area encouraging Christians, uh, and now these Christians uh, who had come to faith through their ministry were allowed to minister uh, to him. Uh, one thing that we should understand as believers, okay, is that we should always be looking for opportunities to serve our brethren, right? Especially when they happen to be those we've benefited from, or those who are deeply involved in the work that the Lord is doing, uh, remembering that when we serve them, we are actually serving our Lord, aren't we? Jesus said, whatever you do to the least of these brothers of mine, you are doing to me. So we do need to be careful how we, we treat one another because that, that, remember we saw before, that means whatever we do negatively, we're also doing to the Lord. But whatever we do positively, we are ministering to the Lord Jesus. Now, this kindness on Julius's part also shows the respect that he had for Paul, whether for him personally or for the fact that he was a Roman citizen and he had to protect. But this will later be his motivation for sparing the prisoners that the soldiers will want to kill. Now, from there, they sailed under the shelter of Cyprus. You'll notice that Cyprus is an island uh, off the coast of uh, Palestine. And you'll look at the eastern side, there's that uh, projection, that peninsula that is extending out. Uh, they were sailing uh, basically behind it in order to protect them from the westerly winds of the summer and fall. And that's the time of year that it was at, at this time. 
Then traveling along the coast of Cilicia and Pamphylia, you can see they're kind of hugging the underside there of, of Asia Minor. They landed at, at Myra in Lycia. Uh, that's that projection at the bottom of Asia Minor. Now, Myra was a, a vital port for grains, ships that were sailing between Alexandria, which you know is in Egypt, and in Rome. And here Julius found a ship from Alexandria headed for Italy. So he put Paul and his companions on, on this ship. Now progress was slow from this point. And after many days, they arrived off Snidus. And I think uh, that is on the map there as well. You'll see it there just below Asia toward the western side. An island that's off the southwest coast of Asia Minor, 130 miles from uh, Mira. Now here, they lost their protection from the winds. Uh, the northwest wind in particular, so instead of heading due west, which would have taken them basically to the north of Crete, and Crete is that next island sticking out there, they took a southwest route that brought them to its southern side, again, that they might use the island for protection against the wind. Pa uh, sailing past Salmon, which is on the eastern side of the island, uh, they came to Fair Havens a harbor on its southern side. Uh, while they stayed there, the weather continued to worsen. Now Luke tells us the time of year. He says the fast was already over. And he was referring here to the fast that was connected to the Day of Atonement. That is the fast that is known as the fast. And that is held in late September through mid-October. It varies you know, from year to year because of the Jewish calendar. Now, at that time, uh, one commentator writes, weather on the Mediterranean became unpredictable and sea travel precarious. Well, so why didn't they just stay where they were then at this particular time? Well, the problem is the Fair Havens presented its own set of difficulties. Because of its location, it was exposed to fierce winds during the winter months. So it really wasn't a suitable harbor in which to winter. So Paul warned them, though, not to go further. They would lose not only the cargo and the ship, but also their lives. Now, Paul said this not because of divine revelation, because that, in fact, did not happen. But he said this from his previous experiences. Remember, this, this, Paul's not a novice here. He's already made three missionary journeys. He's been on ships a number of times. But he was basically looking at the signs, you know, and saying, this, this just isn't a good time to sail. Well, the captain and the pilot were convinced that they could make Phoenix. Now, Phoenix, as you see, is on the far west of the island, and it was a more suitable port to winter in Crete, 40 miles essentially, just 40 miles from, from where they were. So being persuaded by the captain and the pilot, the centurion decided to continue. And when they thought they found their opportunity, they departed, sailing close to the shore. But as they traveled around the Cape, and I don't know if you can see it here, on the southern part of the island, essentially Fair Havens is, is on um, the east side of a small projection of land that we would call a cape. As they rounded the corner, they were struck by a violent wind that's called Uroquillo. And uh, what that essentially means is a northeaster, very, very strong wind, okay? Unable to face the wind, they gave way to it and allowed themselves to be driven along. And if you'll notice at this particular point, they start getting driven uh, towards the southwest by the northeast wind. The wind pushed them towards a small island by the name of Clauda, which gave them temporary shelter from the wind. Uh, at that point, they had a difficult time securing the ship's boat, and the ship's boat there is essentially a small lifeboat that would be used to abandon ship, which we see that the sailors are going to attempt to do in just a few moments. They also undergirded the ship with support cables, now, one commentator writes, because of the danger of violent storms on the Mediterranean, ancient vessels carried ropes that would be tied around the hull sideways in order to strengthen it in an emergency. I, I think you can imagine how that would instill confidence uh, while you're out at sea that you have your ship being held together by these external ropes. But anyway, it just shows you how difficult things were getting. Now, fearing that they might run aground on what is called the Sirtis, you know, the Sirtis are essentially shallows, a sandbar that is further south off the coast of Libya, which on this map is um, called Cyrenaica. Uh, 
they put down the sea anchor. And they did that in order to slow their progress. They didn't want, again, to get stuck out in the middle of the ocean in the middle of that storm. The next day, they began to throw some of the cargo overboard. And the third day, the ships tackle. And this would lighten the ship and improve their chances of survival. Now, the storm continued to blacken the sky for many days so that they couldn't see the sun or the stars. And, you know, that detail is important because that's the way they navigated. You don't see the sun and the stars. They couldn't navigate. They didn't know where, where they were. They didn't know how to get out of you know, the situation they were in. So little by little, they were losing hope that they would even survive. Now, you know, one thing that's interesting about this is that th this is the way the Lord works <laughs> in virtually every situation. Uh, sometimes maybe in a, a smaller way, sometimes in a greater way, depending upon what we need. Right? J.C. Ryle once pointed out in his book, and I've, I think I've mentioned this several times, Christian leaders of the 18th century. He talks about the situation in England before the Great Awakening broke out and how dark the situation got, how immoral the behavior was among the people who lived in Great Britain and also in New England, and how there was basically no one preaching the gospel. But in the midst of this darkness, the Lord breaks in with this great light. He raises up all these ministers. He, he uh, sends this great revival, His Holy Spirit. Many people are, are awakened and converted. And He points out that the Lord often allows the situation to get very dark before He breaks in with His light. And the reason being is the darkness makes the light all the more conspicuous. You know, if everything's going well and the Lord blesses you with something, you don't think much of it. But if, if you're in dire straits and the Lord gives you exactly what it is you need, well, then that's quite impressive. That's when we see it, and that's when we give God the glory that we should give, and that was the case here. So in the, the middle of this darkness, the Lord now sends His promise. After many days, the crew became increasingly weak from lack of food, and Paul stood up and declared in verse 21, men, you ought to have followed my advice and not to have set sail from Crete and incurred this damage and loss. Now, Paul was not saying, as we might be tempted to think, I told you so. You should, you should listen to me, but you didn't. Now you're in trouble. But he was pointing to the wisdom that he had displayed earlier so that perhaps they might listen to what he was now about to say. He urged them to take courage. Though the ship would be lost and its cargo, they would survive. The God to whom he belonged, the God he served, sent his angel with a promise that he must stand before Caesar. Remember, this is what we've seen recurring through the book of Acts as Paul is like the Lord Jesus Christ setting his face to go towards Rome. And he knows that Jesus has already told him that he must bear witness in Rome of the gospel. So Paul knows he's going to get there. But he sends this angel again to remind him and to encourage him that he must. So this was the reason why all these things have taken place, why he was arrested in Jerusalem, why he was put on trial before Felix and Festus and Agrippa, that through his appeal, Paul would be taken to Rome where he might preach the gospel. But that is why Paul could not die. But God, in His mercy, also granted the lives of all who were with Him. So He says, be of good cheer. Because, He says, I believe it will turn out exactly as God has said. Now, again, look at the confidence, look at the faith of the Apostle Paul. Paul had served the Lord long enough to know that God keeps His word. He does what He says. Now, we often think about faith in the context of justification, right? We're, we are saved by God's grace through faith alone. But there is this other aspect of, of faith which comes along with saving faith, and that is we believe what God says, and we trust what He says, and we act upon what He says. If we would simply trust the Lord more, we would be encouraged to act more on His Word. And if we acted more on His Word, we would see more of His power and His glory displayed in our lives. We need to remember that God is faithful and He will do what He said He would do. We, on our part, 
You simply need to trust him. And that's what Paul did with his steadfast, steadfast trust that took away all of his fear. That's the reason why Paul was able to do what he did in his life was because he trusted the Lord and was not afraid of what man would do to him nor even, you know, so-called the forces of nature because he knew they were also under the Lord's control. Well, finally, we see the Lord's promise deliverance. After 14 days, as they were being driven about the Adriatic Sea, and see the map is still up there, so... Um, the Adriatic Sea, as you can see, is up there by Italy. That's where we uh, today call the Adriatic. But in those days, it extended all the way down between Greece and, and Sicily, Sicily being there at the tip of um, Italy. Um, as they were being driven about in this area about midnight, the sailors saw signs that they were approaching land. So they began to take soundings. You know, they, they threw a lead weight with a string overboard to measure the depth. And the first reading was 20 fathoms, about 120 feet deep. When they had gone a little further, they found it to be 15 fathoms. The water was getting shallower. They were afraid that they might run aground on the rocks. And so they let down four anchors and wished, uh, the actual word in the Greek is prayed, and who they prayed to, we don't know. Uh, but they prayed for daybreak. They hoped for daybreak when they'd get a better idea of where they were and what their situation was like. Now, some of the sailors tried to make a break for the land by letting down the ship's boat, pretending that they were going to lay out some more anchors to secure the boat. But Paul saw what they were doing, and he told the centurion, verse 31, which seems sort of strange or mysterious, unless these men remain in the ship, you yourselves cannot be saved. You know, it almost seems like Paul is saying, unless we all stick together, God's not going to let any of us survive. But that's not what he was saying. What he's saying is if these sailors leave and there's nobody around to, to man the ship, then we're going to die, okay? So these men need to stay on board. So otherwise, you and your men and all of us here are going to die. So reminding us again that even though God has a plan, even though he gives a promise, and even though he's working those things out, it, it still requires the efforts of, of people, you see, they needed to stay in the ship, to steer the ship in order to save the people on the ship. Now, God most often fulfills his promises in this way, not through supernatural interventions. We don't really see anything supernatural besides the angel, of course, appearing to Paul. But we see him working through the situation with the boat and the wind and the storm and the sailors and so forth. He works by guiding people and he works by guiding circumstances to bring about his purposes. So after Paul said this, the, the soldiers immediately went to the ropes and cut it, let the boat fall away, so everybody would have to stay in the ship. And then he encouraged them all to eat. If they didn't eat soon, they wouldn't have the strength to continue. Uh, the sailors, again, they needed to steer the ship, so they needed strength to do that. They also needed the strength to be able to swim to shore, because that's also a part of the equation. And without these things, without eating, they also would perish. So again, more means to God's ends. Now, God had promised that none would die, but again, there was something that they needed to do. Then he took some bread, Paul, and he gave thanks to God. He broke it, and he ate it in front of them. And seeing his faith, it encouraged the rest of them also to do the same. Now, Luke tells us there were 276 persons on board, and I don't think that that's some sort of cryptic message, but he was essentially telling us that all these people were brought safely to shore. Paul's example of, of eating in front of them and his faith in the Lord that things would come out well encouraged all of these men. And I think maybe we can take this lesson from that. We should never think that if we are alone, if there's only one of us, okay, there is nothing that we can't do because one isn't enough. With God's grace, one person can make all the difference. Remember that story about Jonathan in the Old Testament, Jonathan and his armor bearer, and he's looking at the Philistine garrison, you know, that's, that's uh, up on the hill, and he thinks to himself, you know what, God doesn't need an army to overcome these guys. He can do it through one. So he said to his armor bearer, let's go up, let's fight him. And, and so they do. And they defeat them, right? Now, 
that doesn't happen in every circumstance. God gave him a particular faith to do that, but it does remind us that God can do great things even through one person. So even if we happen to be alone, like Athanasius against the world, even if it's just one of us, we shouldn't be afraid to let the Lord work through us. Now, after they had eaten, they began to uh, throw the, um, the wheat uh, overboard. Um, and again, they, they didn't um, need these things uh, any longer because uh, they were essentially uh, just moments away from um, going, you know, being, actually landing. But at daybreak, they saw the shore. They didn't recognize it, but they did see a bay with a beach, and they determined to drive the ship onto it. So cutting the anchors loose, they hoisted the foresail, giving them more. I guess the wind must have been in their favor, and they, they headed for it. But before they could reach it, the ship ran aground on a reef, and the waves began to break it apart. The soldiers wanted to kill the prisoners so that none of them would escape, but because the centurion wanted to save Paul, he ordered them not to, but commanded that everyone who could swim should make it for the shore, while those who couldn't would find pieces of wood to help them, and they were all brought safely to shore. Now again, you know, you have this dark situation. In the midst of that dark situation, you have the Lord interject His promise, and we see the Lord kept His promise. Okay, not one of the sailors, not one of the soldiers, not one of the prisoners died. And this reminds us that God keeps His promises. Not one word that He has spoken will ever fail. And the reason that He will keep these promises is because of what He has done through Jesus Christ. You know, if, he, if He's given us a son, won't He also give us with Him all things? And hasn't He confirmed for us every promise in the Lord Jesus Christ, in Him, everything Paul says in 2 Corinthians 1.20 is yes. And so we should say, amen, so be it. We just simply need, if we, if we want to experience, again, the Lord's faithfulness in the fulfillment of His promises, we simply need to trust Him and to obey Him on the basis of those promises, even when we don't see the fulfillment of the promise, we still need to live in light of that promise and obey it. It reminds me again of Jonathan Edwards, who, um, as he was thinking about facing the uh, congregation of people that were really upset with him because of, um, what was it, because he came against his grandfather with regard to his views on the Lord's table, he realized that he had to preach the truth even though he knew his congregation would get very angry. So rather than letting what he thought the congregation would do, what the outcome would be if he did what he was supposed to do and then made his decisions based upon what he thought they might do, instead he looked at God's Word and he says, what should I do? And he did that and he let the Lord work out the circumstances that were ahead of him. So in other words, he obeyed in light of God's promise that he would work all of this together for his good and he didn't make his decision based upon what he thought the outcome would be if he did the right thing, okay? So that's what it means to live in light of the promise and, and in, in, in light of what God says in His Word. Don't think about what might happen if you do what God calls you to do. Just think about what God calls you to do and do that. And then trust God that He's going to work out the circumstances for your good and, and for His glory. Well, let's, uh, let's bow in a moment of prayer, and let's, uh, as we pray, let's prepare uh, to come to the table this morning.